All right, so we have the computer started. We're back on uh, new egg. Are there any questions about what we talked about last time? Because we talked about uh, power supply, how you know how you know the thermal side of you know thing is actually the limiting factor of how much processing power you can be can pack in a small room or small building. I mean, Four thousand square feet is not really a lot of space. Um, any questions? Yep, go ahead. What about like laptops? Um, like are they overheat? Laptop computers do overheat. They do tend to overheat more often than desktop computers. And that's because you cannot really put a big uh, fan, you know, inside a laptop computer, like the one that we just looked at l l last time. It would not even cl it would not even clear um, the overhang of my case. And I can show you the, the kind of case that I have is is really quite big, <laughs> and it would even it would not even clear that. Um, when you have a laptop computer, you will actually see the vents, you know, for the exhaust vent, you know, for the processor. And can you guess where the processor is? Right by It's right next to it, exactly. Okay, and that's how close it has to be in order to you know, extract heat away from the processor effectively inside you know, a laptop computer. If you have a gaming laptop computer, it probably has multiple vents, one for the processor and the other one for the graphics card or the graphics chipset itself. And the graphics chipset is once again right next to the vent because it has to be that close in order not to have the air to kind of pass through different places to get outside of the uh, computer. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and that's why gaming laptop computers are very expensive to begin with. And then two, you know, they also usually lack the longevity of a desktop computer because things just run a lot harder. Um, I want to share with you something that I found um, after the lecture on Tuesday. I found this thing that seems kind of kind of impressive to me. So I will share that first. And I thought I put it here somewhere. Oh, right there. Okay, I found this product. Um, it's called Indigo Extreme. So let's go there and take a quick look. Indigoextreme.com. And it's a very interesting product. Um, I'll let you. I'll leave it up to you guys to click the links and watch the video. Um, <clears throat> but basically, you know, uh, these this particular product uh, puts you know Arctic Silver Five, you know, to shame. It's like wow, you know, it's completely different. Um, let me click on how it works here. Um, this particular product is not a thermal paste. What it is, is I think it's a low melting point temperature you know, alloy of some kind. Um, and you basically, <coughs> when you reflow it, it becomes you know, a complete, um, it, it will cover the surface <coughs> of your processor completely. Um, it's basically, it's a, it's a metal, okay? And you put it between the processor and um, the CPU cooler and under heat, you know, it will start to melt. It will start to, you know, in um, electronic terms, we call it flowing. Okay, it's called reflowing. You know, you're melting uh, metal to make it, you know, flow again. It's called reflowing, and it will basically reflow, melt, reflow, and then it will just cover, you know, all the um, irregular, you know, surfaces between the processor and the CPU cooler in a much better way compared to all the other products. Sorry. Oh, better than uh, Arctic Much better. Not just better, it is extremely good. Go ahead, you had a question. Yeah, better than that ceramic one, too. CPU, isn't it on the weak side? On the weak side? No, no, there's no polishing. You know, what happens is, you know, the this particular product um, looks like this. You know, it's basically a plate that you apply, you know, that you put between. Is it shiny? Um, it's metallic, so it is shiny once you apply it. Um, and it says right here, you know, let, let's just, you know, read this part here. Uh, hmm. <laughs> I can't. There we go. 
So it says right here, the overall thermal performance of a thermal interface is the sum of the bulk thermal resistance, <coughs> which is the inverse of the bulk thermal conductance of the material and its two surface contact resistance. Grease is good, and this particular product um, achieves high thermal performance through the optimized deployment of molten, oxygen-free PCMA, and PCMA was explained a little bit earlier up here. It is a phase change metallic alloy. So I was, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, reading this. So it's basically what, what it is, is a low melting point temperature um, alloy, you know, which means it is metallic, okay? It's kind of like solder, except it melts, you know, at a very, very low temperature. And when it melts, you know, it becomes, you know, just like, you know, mercury or, you know, something that is liquid. So now we can actually just cover, you know, all the, you know, irregular surface you know, or all the ir irregular um, parts of the surface between the processor <coughs> and also the CPU fan. And it does a much better job at that compared to grease. And when your processor is running hot, uh, start to warm up, and what happens is, you know, this metal, this alloy will start to get molten again. It will become you know, basically liquid state again. And then you will have the con um, little circulation, microcurrent, you know, going on between um, the CPU surface and also the processor, the CPU cooler surface. And that microcurrent combined with the natural ability of metal to conduct heat will basically transfer heat from the processor to the CPU cooler you know, very, very effectively. I have not used this product before because this is the first time that I actually found it um, you know, by reading you know, Tom's Hardware and some other articles. Um, you can also click on you know, how it compares and you can see you know, how this product really works much better than everything else. The blue line, okay, let me just kind of point out the blue line here. The blue line is um, the property or the characteristic of this particular product. And Arctic Silver 5 is the um, kind of orange one, which is you know, kind of up here. So the way you read this chart is at 150 watts, okay, which is you know, this vertical line, you have to project to the y-axis to find out you know, what is the temperature rise. You can see that with Arctic Silver 5, the temperature rise is quite a bit you know, higher compared to this particular product, which is way down there. Yep? Um, would a product like this be able to be removed after you're done with it? Like, so, supposing they come out with a new one, you want to put that on it instead of the old one? Um, because it reflows, um, if it, it depends on which surface it sticks to. If it sticks to the CPU cooler surface, then you can, yes, you can reuse the CPU cooler um, but I think you can always add additional, you know, alloy to make it reflow again. But you have to be careful not to have the product to kind of leak out because it is conductive. It's, it's really metallic. Um, but it's a very interesting product. This is the first time I've seen something like this. Yep. <laughs> that I have not priced out because I, you know, I, I have already set up my own computer. And $5,000. <laughs> no, it won't be that expensive. Um, wow, these places I have never, I don't even know that you know, they existed. Okay, so let's see. It's not expensive at all. Nine bucks. Nine bucks is good for one application. So these are extremely specific to the socket type. Yep. Have you read your view? Yeah, I have read, you know, and that's how I found these. I was reading reviews on the ceramic type uh, thermal paste, you know, because after the class I got really curious of, you know, okay, what is the performance of the ceramic type uh, thermal paste as opposed to Arctic Silver. So I was only look, looking for comparison between the ceramic, you know, uh, thermal paste and Arctic Silver 5. And then I found, you know, a comparison that included this particular product, and that reviewer basically said, you know, Arctic Silver 5 is by comparison trash, you know, when it comes to, you know, um, the performance. It is much better. Arctic Silver 5 is much better than the one that comes with the CPU package, okay? You know, so I'm not saying that Arctic Silver 5 is not good at all. It is good enough for general application. I mean, I don't have any complaints about, you know, Arctic Silver 5, you know, in my computer. But for people who are really overclocking and want the most, the best performance out of the, the thermal paste, I think this one, you know, is you know a better product if you're you know, going after extreme overclocking and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, 
Um, is this something that like is a definite like once you place on you never have to deal with it again or is it yes. something you okay yeah this product does not cure um, they what they also do is you know they would put a thermal paste like Arctic Super 5 or the ceramic type or whatever they would put it you know they would use it regularly okay in, in its regular use and then after a year or two they would disassemble the whole thing again and then they would try to see whether the, the, the material dries out or cure on the surface of the CPU cooler and the CPU uh, CPU surface itself and they found that you know, with Arctic Silver 5 and the ceramic products you know, they do cure and they do lose some of their um, you know, flexibility or the moisture not the moisture but they, 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 they dry out over time um, this kind of product never dries out because it is liquid crystal and it does not vaporize. It's just in a, in a molten state. So it's, it's interesting. Now, the only thing that I'm kind of thinking, mm, okay, you know, that's the only thing that I'm kind of, I have questions about is the toxicity of this material. What, what kind of metal does it actually use in the alloy and, you know, how toxic is it? Um, because to get this kind of property, you know, they have to use something that is probably not very common. And the question is, you know, is it you know, toxic to, you know, human being if you touch it and, you know, have residue of that thing being around, you know, is it really, really toxic? Um, but it's certainly interesting. It is certainly a very interesting kind of uh, product. And for those of you who want to, you know, overclock things and, you know, make things run really, really hot, um, you know, this is something that you can look into. I'm not endorsing the product or saying, you know, oh, you should buy this, you know, instead of Arctic Super 5. But I'm just saying that, you know, it is interesting. It's, it's definitely an interesting alternative to the usual thermal paste that we purchase. Yep. Is it $9 actually cheaper than Arctic Super um, One tube of Arctic Super 5, you know, you can actually get multiple applications out of it. Yeah. Um, this is a single application for sure. Okay. Yeah, I think this product is kind of interesting because they give you, you know, from what I have seen so far, you know, I haven't seen any YouTube. You can probably dig it up on YouTube too, like, you know, people who are actually using it and how to use it. But from what I can see, you know, it comes with a little card thing and you put that card, you know, on top of the CPU and then the uh, CPU cooler. And then when it operates, you know, it will start to melt and then you can extract, you know, the rest of it, you know, out of the, uh, the slot. But I'm not 100% sure. But I think the application of this product is not like you know, something that you... So if you had multiple ones that you had to get, it wouldn't be cheaper. But if you only had one, then it would be cheaper. Correct, yes. And then plus, you get the, uh, you, you get, you're getting the performance that you're looking after. Okay? Because you know, the effectiveness of the product you know, makes it you know, a very attractive you know, alternative to Arctic Super 5. Um, in other words, things that are not possible with Arctic Silver 5, you know, as a thermal paste, would be possible with this product. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, and you. I'm sorry. Uh, That's also, okay. did you end up finding out what the comparison between the ceramic versus the Arctic Circle 5? They are pretty much the same, uh, with the ceramic slightly edging out, you know, but it's not, it's not significant. Okay. Yep. So, and people also complain that the uh, ceramic type was harder to apply. It's not as soft, you know, as a thermal paste. It's actually harder compared to Arctic Silver 5. Now, I have used Arctic Silver 5 for a long time, so I know, you know, its consistency is really, really soft, and, you know, it's just like, you know, it's, it's kind of like animal grease, okay, you know, lard, um, and it's really easy to apply, and when you plop something onto, you know, um, when you plop uh, the CPU cooler on top of the CPU with that paste, um, it just makes instant contact, you know, and you don't have to, deal with it much. Uh, with the ceramic type, you know, it has a 30 hour time of quote unquote burning time. So, you know, during the first 30 hours of the application, your temperature would actually gradually decrease because it needs that time to, I guess, you know, get rid of the air bubbles and, you know, get uh, to situate itself, you know, nicely between the two surfaces. Uh, with Arctic Silver 5, it's like instant. I mean, you, you, you apply it, you know, from day one, you get the same performance. The graphic. Uh, the, the graph that you showed earlier, yeah. Um, in between Arctic Circle Five and uh, Extreme Indico, there was like some like XJ something or other. Yeah, I have not used that product either. So you mean the in between? There's a Shin. You got the roller <coughs> suit? No. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can look up this product too, and just you know find out. You know, read read the reviews. Read multiple reviews on the product. 
you know, and see how they test it, and then see the results, you know, before you can say, oh, okay, you know, I think this product really is better than the other one. Um, so anyway, you know, something that's kind of interesting that I did not know before, and apparently, you know, for some people, this is like, oh, it has been around for a long time, and you know, yep. Um, because uh, I remember you saying like one of the major things that's like holding back technological progress is actually heating because higher processing uh, cooling high, yep. yeah it requires cool uh, things to be cooler regarding this would if this became a more commonplace item would we see a larger uh, upsurgence in technological processing hmm. because it's more capable by a significant margin, if this became more commonplace thing to use. Okay, but that's a good question. Um, that's a good question because you know to get to extract heat out of a processor, you have multiple steps. Okay, so we'll, I'll just go ahead and draw a picture here. So let's say this is your CPU. This is your your Pentium i7 processor or whatever. Okay, um, and then you have your CPU fan block here. Okay, so I'm just gonna draw a very simplified picture of a CPU heat sink here. And then you have a fan, you know, basically blowing air through the fins to extract the heat. So that's a very simplified picture of you know what is happening. Um, from the CPUs on the on the CPU itself, beneath the metallic surface that you see is the actual silicon chip. Okay, so the first barrier is from the silicon chip to the metallic surface on the CPU itself. Okay. But that part, you know, you have no control over, and I think it is done by, you know, little, um, uh, very small conductors, you know, of heat you know, going from the processor die to the metallic surface, because you don't want, you know, everything to be, um, because you, you cannot have conductance, you know, shorting out the circuit inside the CPU. So that part you have no control over. Um, the thermal paste is here. In other words, it's one link of that whole chain. Okay, so it's it's the thermal paste. You know, in this case, you know, what what I'm mentioning here is basically making the efficiency going from here, which is the surface of the processor, to the surface of the CPU cooler, to be very effective. Okay, but after that, you still have the fins. Okay, how do you distribute heat to all the fins that are you know that will basically distribute the heat? And these days, people use you know, the combine the concept of a heat pipe that, that we talked about last time, and also you know uh, met uh, metals that have a good property of thermal conductance, like aluminum and also copper, to you know to finish that part. And then you have the airflow, the, the fan actually blowing air you know through this to help it cool down. Um, so every single link along this chain, you know, has an impact to the overall, you know, thermal performance of the of the heat sinking system or a cooling system. So it's just going to be like one little bit. It'll uh, be significant to notice a change, but not necessarily excessively significant. That's correct. Yep. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. It does help a lot, you know, when your CPU gets a lot hotter than the normal ones. You know, when you when people overclock a high performance, you know, CPU. Then they are talking about the difference that you know, they're, they're talking about you know, something that makes a difference you know, when it comes to the thermal paste. Now, on the other hand, you know, with my setup, you know, I'm not overclocking my i7 processor. It's not really a, a six-core you know, processor. It's only a four-core processor. It has a you know inherent design of only 77 watts of thermal output. So in my case, you know, even with Arctic Silver 5, which looks really bad on this chart is already sufficient because the processor doesn't generate all that much heat to begin with. So even with a thermal paste that's just mm, mediocre compared to this product, it's still okay. okay. It's kind of like when you have a you know 1.3 liter engine, like in my hybrid Civic, um, the, the size of the radiator doesn't really matter all that much because the engine is so small that, you know, making, you know, if, if I you know, rip off a radiator from a Corvette and put it into my Civic, it's not going to improve the performance by any means, okay? Simply because, you know, the output of my you know, little 1.3 liter <laughs> engine does not need all that surface area to get rid of the heat. And it's the same thing here. If you have a smaller processor or a processor that does not have that kind of thermal output, then it doesn't matter. Now, when you go to the extreme ones, you know, with six cores or more, then it starts to become a significant factor. Mm -hmm. 
So what you said is true. You know, when everybody starts to use you know, the extreme version or you know, a processor that has you know, six, eight, or 10 cores, then this kind of product can push you know, the performance up a little bit because now it's possible to put those things into a laptop computer. But it's not going to like all of a sudden spike the technological uh, bracket, so to speak. Um, it's in the end, it's still limited by you know yeah. the airflow and also you know how much heat can you dump into a room because you have to eventually extract that you know heat from the room itself as well. I mean, we live in Sacramento, which can get kind of warm <coughs> in the summer, right? Um, and if you have you know, like a few of these you know high power computers, high po high power computers in a room, you can see that you know it, you already have a problem of extracting heat from the room itself. So it's not really just you know the thermal paste, but overall speaking, what is the ambient temperature? That also has some impact on um, the you know, how much processing power can you pack into your computer? Yep. Question. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Question. Yep. Okay, you said uh, the fins are a, uh, a factor into uh, the overall efficiency of uh, heat extraction. Is it's one of the links. It's one of the limiting factors. Is, the, is there a, a number in particular or a size or a number of fins? It has to do with a, the, a combination of all of those. So let's go back to CPU coolers, fans and heat sinks here. Yep, go ahead. Is that, um, is it made of copper? Oh, well, we'll take a look. Good. So once again, we'll go by you know rating. The one that we talked about last time is not made out of copper. So if I took take a look at a close-up picture, okay. So this thing, it's you know it's not entirely made out of copper. Certain parts are made out of copper. Um, this is a side view of the CPU you know, of the CPU cooler. The fins, I think they're made out of aluminum or some kind of alloy that is not uh, copper. The heat pipes, on the other hand, are made out of coppers, uh, copper material. And then the block that actually makes the contact with the CPU is made out of aluminum. But they, let me see if I can show you a picture of the bottom. But the, I think the exposure was not very good. But you can see you know, how the block itself is actually making contact, the, the heat pipe is making direct contact with the processor in this case. So that's why it is also a very efficient design because you don't have the interface between the block and then the heat pipe. The heat pipe itself is directly contacting the surface of the processor. So it's, a, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a pretty good design. Um, but in terms of the material used, in it, it's between aluminum and um, copper. Are there any questions at this point? Now this may be a good good uh, good time to kind of mention, you know, how dust bunnies can kill your computer, <coughs> right? Because if you look at the fins, okay, from the side, you know, this is this is really a good view to see, you know, how small of a gap it is between, you know, fins of this particular, you know, heat sink. What do you think dust bunnies can do in this case? They can restrict airflow for one thing, okay. Now, even if you don't have that much dust to restrict airflow entirely, the dust can settle on the fins. And what would that do to uh, the fins? If you have dust adhering to the fins, Wouldn't that insulate them? it will help to insulate, exactly. So that means it, it becomes harder and harder and harder for heat to irradiate, you know, or to give to, for heat to be carried away by the airflow you know, from the fins. Okay. And this is one reason you have to really clean up your computer once in a while, because you know it will collect dust over time, and you know it's just something that will happen. You might as well you know schedule like every year. You know you just you know, spend some time to dust your computer, you open up the case, you know get a you know, can of compressed air or an electric blower. Okay, they make you know electric um, blowers that can also be used you know, for cleaning computers. Um, just clean it up once a year, and you know that will help extend the uh, longevity of your computer a little bit. Yep. When you say cleaning, is open the whole corner, or just open up the entire computer, open up the case, and then but you have to be careful because one, you know, you have to be 
you cannot have um, static charge on you, you know, when you work with computers. So you have to discharge yourself first to make sure that you don't shock your computer, you kill your computer in the process. So the recommendation is to, you know, you have to um, remove the power cord too, because you know, most uh, CPUs or most motherboards are partially powered even after you press the power key to turn off the computer. It is still partially powered. And if you accident accidentally drop anything that's conductive onto the motherboard, you can short it out even though the computer was turned off. Okay, so the best approach is really just to you know, unplug it completely from the wall so it's, it cannot possibly be powered except for the uh, little battery to power up the, the real-time clock, but that's really a very small portion of the circuit. Um, but at the same time, you need to touch the case of another computer maybe or another appliance next to it because the casing of most appliances, a, a three-prong appliance, is connected to the ground. So if you have any ESD electrostatic uh, charge or ES uh, electrostatic charge <coughs> on you, then touching something that is grounded will help you know, dissipate all that you know electro uh, static charge, and then you can actually go ahead and you know touch the computer without having to worry that you might kill the computer in the process. Uh, my older computer, I used to open it, mm -hmm. clean up, but this computer somehow they got a Mm -hmm. Okay, I can see. Okay, you can do that, but that's really just cleaning the that particular area because you know dust can get into the case and settle on the components inside the computer. So what you are, what you were cleaning is really just the, the dust that is you know attaching to the case or the holes you know of the vent, but not necessarily the dust that is already in the case you know that is attached to the CPU fins or the fins of the CPU cooler. Um, you know I do it you know maybe once a year or so you know and my where I put my own computer is not really particularly dusty. My pets don't get to that place and it's you know just in my own room. And it's already dusty enough, you know, if you have any pet, you know, pets, you know, um, especially birds, you know, anything that sheds, you know, you can end up with a lot of dust in a very short amount of time. So you got to kind of watch out for that. Are there any, you know, horror stories that anyone want to share you know, when they clean their computers? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, it was my computer. It was actually uh, a friend's computer that I was cleaning out, and it was one of those... Uh, Towers roughly about the size of the one that you have there. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit smaller. Okay, so um, mid size maybe. And uh, yeah, I guess it was a three or four year old computer, and I was just helping him uh, make it better. You know, it was really old and it needed a little tune up. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I opened up the case, almost the entirety of the, of the inside of the case was filled with dust bunnies. And like, it, it was so bad that it wasn't like taking your dust blaster and blasting it. It was more a matter of your hands in it. Wow, you can actually, wow, yeah. okay, you can shovel that you know, dust out of that yeah, uh, no, case. Yeah, I've never ever seen anything like it, and I guess it was, uh, where he kept it was right next to um, his air conditioning unit, which I think he thought would uh, help. Help it cool it down? Help it cooling, but I guess because the air conditioning was pulling air from the outside, and the outside was all dusty and all that, that it was just throwing it right in there. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Could you vacuum it? Hmm? Could you vacuum it? Um, okay, Th this is an interesting question. How do you clean the inside and the outside of a computer? Okay, now that's, there are, you know, things that you really have to watch out for. Okay, one thing that I, you know, this is kind of... Because um, one time I was working at um, uh, Geek Squad, a friend of mine at blew a whole bunch of dust out and it was, went all over the place. It seemed like vacuuming was better than blowing it. it okay. Mess. So let's talk about how to clean your computer, okay? Because you know, that really is an important topic and it does relate to some of the things that, you know, that we have talked about already. So this is the back side of a computer. So we typically have your you know, ports over here and then the power supply has its own fan and then this, the case has its own fan and then you have the PCI Express, PCI, and all the other slots you know, down here. Um, 
If you use a vacuum cleaner and you just you know, stick the vacuum cleaner hose to one of these you know, opening and then you turn on the vacuum cleaner, you can destroy that fan. Because you know your vacuum cleaner is creating so much airflow that it will spin up the blades of a, a CPU, you know, a, a case fan, to the speed where it's not designed for, and then it will just destroy the bearing, you know, or whatever you know lubrication it has, you know, to, and you can just destroy it. I mean, that's so it's not a very good idea to stick a vacuum hose, especially one of those, you know, the shop vacs, because the shop vacs are extremely powerful. The hoses are like you know this big, you know, in terms of the cross section area, and they're designed you know for you know picking up stuff, you know, in the garage. Okay, you know, my my father in law would use his to pick up you know broken you know, window and stuff like that. You know, and it doesn't bother the vacuum cleaner at all. You know, picking up all the broken pieces of a window and whatnot. You know, if if there's one piece that's too big for the vacuum cleaner, he just whacks it with a hammer, breaks it even more, and then the vacuum cleaner is like, you know. It picks up everything, <laughs> you know. And if you stick one of those things here, I almost guarantee that, that your fan will be destroyed. Okay, so you cannot just you know stick a you know regular vacuum cleaner to clean it out. Um, what I usually do is I use compressed air to kind of you know push the dust out. Yes, it does make the surrounding very dusty. So you may not you may want to move the computer to a place where dust is not as much of an issue. Uh, but that really is the better way to do it is to use a controlled you know source of air to blast you know the air the dust out. That means do not use your you know air compressor <laughs> intended for you know pneumatic tools because that's way too much airflow too. So you got to make sure that you're using a you know source of air that is reasonable for cleaning but not too much. Yep. Um. I use, uh, in the past, I used you know, these compressed air cans. Compressed air, and this is the canned ones. Um, gas duster, okay. So this is you know, typically something that you can buy from um, various you know, places like Home Depot, not Home Depot, Office Depot, Office Max, and stuff like that. Just uh, two weeks ago, I got it at Walmart for like five bucks. For oh, five bucks, a big yeah, old case, right? Yeah, well, yeah big can. Yeah. Now these things, you know, there are several reasons why I personally do not like to use these. One is um, they're not very environmental. Okay, you know, even if you recycle the can itself, it is still not very environmental. Um, but besides that, there's another issue. Has anyone tried to use these kind of you know, um, compressed air, you know, duster uh, for an extended period of time, like, and then what happens to your hand? Yep, your hand gets frozen, right? And it has it's it's physics. Okay, we cannot defeat you know, physics because in, in physics it says your PV divided by T is a constant. Okay, P is pressure, V is volume, and T is temperature. Okay, so the relationship between these three is like this. Okay, the content inside you know, those compressed air cans is very high to begin with. So you have a really huge P. Volume does not change, okay, because you know, the can itself does not change its size when you're using it. Um, but T can change as well. So when, as you are you know, uh, pressing that you know, uh, canister thing to release the air, uh, the pressure starts to drop, right? Because inside you know, the air is coming out and you know, the pressure starts to drop. Um, the volume is actually increasing because it's coming outside, but the temperature has to, has to match um, the pressure in order to keep this thing a constant. And that's why the temperature is dropping. Okay, It's just you know when you lose pressure, the temperature has to drop in order to keep this K as a constant. Um, it can get to the point where you can burn. You can get the freezer burn on your fingers. So you have to be careful with those things. Um, once you get to the point where it's you know really cold, you have to let it sit for a while for the content to heat up again. Then you can use it again. Okay, so that's one. That's the, the second reason why I do not like to use the, this kind of product. Is just that you know when you are using this kind of product, you can use it like you know maybe for you know bursts of ten, you know twenty seconds or so at the most, and then after that it get, it gets so cold that you have to kind of you know let it sit for a while. I guess that's why people buy cases of twenty fours you know with these things, so they can just use one. Shh, oh, this is getting too cold. Grab the next one. You know. Make it really cold. Grab the next one, and then keep going. Like, yep. I did find a uh, YouTube video on how 
muscle packer about how to make a, a refillable air can. Yeah, the refillable ones, you know, they work out okay too. They still have the same issue because you cannot defeat, you know, the PV over T. Um, but it becomes more environmental because you can charge it with either a tire pump or a compressor. Um, so I got one of these myself. <coughs> um, you know, exactly the same brand, you know, but they come in different name, you know, different brand names. Sometimes, um, if you turn them upside down, they yeah. spray out liquid nitrogen, which is kind of cool, but... It's not liquid aside nitrogen, from that, by the way. You know, it's some kind of, you know, coolant, but it's not liquid nitrogen. And that's a trick that people use a lot in the uh, in industry, in the semiconductor industry, because in the semiconductor industry, a lot of times, you know, a failure is temperature dep dependent. You can have a component that works okay, you know, um, below a certain temperature, and then when it gets to the threshold, it will start to become unreliable. If it exceeds that temperature, it will just die. So one trick in the semiconductor industry is to, to figure out what's wrong with a board is to selectively cool down the chips, okay, and see which one, you know, starts to make a difference when you cool it down. And to do that, what you do is you reverse the can, you make it upside down, and then you spray it. Because what you're spraying in that case is not the gas coming out of the liquid, it is the actual liquid itself. And that liquid, when it touches anything, it will you know, just you know, absorb all the heat that you can to in order to, you know, to phase change into gas. Uh, which makes it kind of dangerous, because if you spray it on skin, you can end up with a you know, serious you know, freezer burn wherever that thing drops onto. Okay? Um, so that's basically what that guy was talking about. And let me see if I can just kind of I've experienced skip. that. It's not nice. No. Oh, you did? <laughs> um, they kind of cost a lot, and they're not really super effective. Usually, you're, you're looking at a narrow spray of air. Um, the nozzle's not very big on that, even if you pop off. If you pop off the nozzle, usually your amount of, or, or your strength of your airflow is going to be reduced. OK, so here's the another thing that, you know, that is kind of like a, um, some people think, you know, since it's t a tiny little straw, you can get to tight places better. That's actually not true because, you know, the airflow is so restricted out of that little straw thing. Um, even if you can get to tight spaces, it's not really that big of a help. Um, yep. They're only really nice for cleaning up keyboards really quickly. That's about it. For yep. inside computers, they're terrible. Yep. And do not use a vacuum cleaner like a regular vacuum cleaner, especially a shop vac on the keyboard. Do you th what do you think will happen when you try to clean up your keyboard using a shop vac? Yep, all the keys will disappear. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You know, go find you know a keyboard that you don't care about anymore, especially with on the laptop computers, something that is really really flat, and just use a shop vac to try to clean up the keyboard. You can rip keys out of a keyboard just like that. <laughs> All right. uh, this, on the other hand, the electric duster you can see is a little bit more heavy duty. You've got several different attachments for it. This one actually has a hole in the top, not to, uh, I think it's to lock it in. Yeah, it's to, because you got too much pressure here. Let me just put that on so you guys can see. There you go. So they put a hole in the top of this part because... All right. This is called a concentrator, okay? It concentrates the airflow, but trust me, it does not do that. All it does is to restrict the airflow. <laughs> so don't, if you get in something like this, you know, a, an electric duster, don't put on that little nozzle thing. It doesn't really help in any way. I leave mine off and just use the, the full blast. The volume of air is just amazing out of something this small. Um, let me see. Let me see if I can just skip the part where he turned it like that thing on. And I'll just use this narrow attachment. Oh, he did. Yep, it's just a few seconds. Yeah, you can see the. You can see how hot it is blowing the air. Good. Yeah. Yep. So um, the way I do it is I don't even put on the concentrator because the concentrator also restricts you know, the amount of airflow. And their airflow is not only for cleaning, cleaning your computer, it's also for cooling the blower motor of this thing. 
So the, if you put on a restrictor like that, um, the blower itself will get hot okay, over time. And it will get hot quicker because it doesn't have the airflow to cool itself down. So I, what I do is I just sort of leave that thing off unless I have to you know, reach a you know, really tight space and whatnot. Um, then I put this on you know, only for short amounts of time. Otherwise, I just use the entire unit as a whole without that. So it's a little more powerful. Um, it is very powerful compared to the chem chemical type, you know, the canister type. This is very powerful. Okay, you know, it doesn't concentrate the airflow. It is like, it's just a lot of air, you know, moving, um, and it does heat up. It's kind of heavy. It's very noisy. So you need to put on, you know, hearing protection if you want to preserve your hearing. Yep. So it's a handheld Yes, that's basically what it is. <laughs> yep. The, the other one is. This one here, that's the chemical type, you know, that's basically compressed air in a can. This one is an electric one, so it runs on electricity. Uh, because my, um, my, one of my neighbors, before her, her daughter used to um, come over to our house and ask for the can, she'd say she'd need them for projects, but um, she was um, uh, one of those kids at Huff, and she was using those. Oh. Yeah, I don't know what propellant, you know, it's called a propellant, you know, basically it's a... Little red straws, come over. It was just really weird, though. Sniffing it, right? These ones, 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 these And compressed air sniffing. Huffing. Huffing. Yeah. How to call it again? Huffing? Huffing. Ah. Yeah, that still doesn't keep people from doing it. But what, <laughs> but what kind of chemical is in that kind of thing? I don't know, but she is looking pretty scary afterwards. All it needs to do is just decrease the amount of oxygen in your brain that creates. Uh, That's it. The most common of gas of in the dusters is this or that. Um, both look, you know, really kind of bad to me because anything that has fluoro in it, you know, which is, you know, fluorine, um, can be, you know, kind of toxic to people. Okay, it's not actually fluorine, you know, the, the, the gas itself, but chemicals that contain fluorine, you know, is, you know, by itself, you know, can be toxic. Um, I don't know the effect of huffing. Does anyone know? From hearing from other people, obviously. I had a friend that, uh, That's really sad. Present, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this kind of chemical, I think it just you know somehow bonds to your neurons or something. So it has an effect on the brain, I guess. Severe and your body. Like oh really? Is it kind of like carbon dioxide? It's a uh, hallucinations, headache, dizziness, loss of consciousness, spasms. Oh. Well, since we're hands. reading the short-term effects, it might as well long, read the long-term too. Long-term effects will include emotion. weight loss. Wow, that's enough reason for some people to get started. <laughs> 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 no, no, don't do that. I mean, this is not a good reason to get you to use this. Muscle weakness, change in coordination, disorientation, um, difficulty carrying on the conversation or processing thoughts. So it does have an impact on the frontal lobe of your brain because that's awesome. where you do all the processing and all the uh, thoughts. Yep. Um, be, yeah. Mostly it's because it's just like starving your brain of oxygen. Enough long-term like oxygen deprivation to your brain can actually cause like almost a great majority of those things. Like the bone marrow damage and uh, whatnot, that's probably chemical based, but a ton of like the preliminary ones uh -huh. are actually based off of, of yeah, just brain uh, oxygen deprivation. Wow. Because I've seen like things where like divers and whatnot have very similar kinds of side effects because uh -huh. they don't, because like they're not wearing like the proper gas mask or like just deep sea divers that don't uh, have Oh, what is that particular thing called? Oxygen poisoning. The, the, the nitrogen mix. When they do saturation diet, 
Uh huh. They yeah. A mix of the mix that uh, offsets the uh, volume of oxygen. So your yeah. Your body has to adapt to it, and you have to adapt yourself back to normal. Yeah, and that, that can have the same effect. Yeah, but if you keep going, you know, ongoing spasms of the limbs, hearing loss, and damage to the to bone marrow. Yeah, that's I mean, that really chemical. is serious <laughs> stuff. I mean, that is serious, you know, stuff. <laughs> damage to the liver and kidney may also occur, and it is irreversible in some cases. Just the lack of oxygen, like you know, too much carbon dioxide, would lead to the short-term effects, mm -hmm. but not. None of these, you know, really yeah. bad long-term ones, you know, like because the lack of oxygen of is usually reversible. So if you take someone who passed out because of the lack of oxygen, and you just take that person outside where there's enough oxygen, that person will probably recover 100%. Mm. Um, this doesn't look like you know something that can recover 100%. Um, yeah, so I did not know, you know, the effect of these uh, dusters, you know. Um, but that's not the reason why I use a data vac, you know, or a electric version. It's really just for the sheer um, brute force of this thing. I mean, it's just so much faster to clean out a computer um, because there's just a whole lot more airflow, and it's not to the point where it can destroy, you know, the fins or, or the fans or something like that. It's just, you know, just a good, you know, um, compromise, you know, between um, volume and speed. Uh, but the only downside is it, it is kind of noisy because it's like a vacuum cleaner um, using the same kind of blower technology. Um, and it does get heated up. So you have kind of, when it gets hot or warm, you just kind of let it stand for a little bit and then you can use it again. Any questions about how to clean your computer? Yep. So the uh, duster cap, when it says uh, compressed air, it's actually reality death in a cap. It is. Toxic air, I guess, <laughs> air that can be considered toxic at a you know concentration at a particular concentration. So Everything so is a little toxic at some point. You know, it's just that you know this stuff is. Well, the worst part is it's, it's it doesn't have a smell. When was the last time you hear someone dying from ammonia poisoning? It's very seldom because <coughs> our detection limit or threshold of aluminum of uh, ammonia is very low. In other words, you know, you can have a, just a little bit of um, ammonia in air, and we'll all go like, "Ooh, what is that smell?" Same thing with H two S. You know, it's the, the rotten egg smell. You know, from that particular kind of gas. It is toxic. Those two gases are definitely are definitely toxic. Not really, really toxic like you breathe and you die, but they are toxic in concentration. But you, no one is going to stay in you know in a room with that kind of chemical for too long because it just stinks. Okay, this kind of chemical has no smell. Okay, it, it, you cannot detect anything like that in your room. Same thing with carbon monoxide has no smell, and that's why it kills people. If carbon monoxide smells like a rotten egg, I really don't think that many people would die from it. Yep. Uh, does the carbon monoxide, while it doesn't have a smell, but the, the, the stuff that goes along with it, I think, makes you pseudo think it smells sweet. Which one? Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is I've super. Been in a place where uh huh. On multiple occasions, and every time I'm there, there's like a really, really, really faint, sweet smell. I don't know how. To oh, okay. Well, carbon monoxide kills very effectively, much more so than the chemicals that we just saw. You know, because um, it bonds permanently with your hemoglobin. You know, the 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 red blood cell thing that carries oxygen, it binds to it permanently, and as a result. Um, your hemoglobin, your red blood cell, becomes completely useless after exposure to carbon monoxide because there's no way to get rid of it and it cannot bond to oxygen anymore. So the only way to treat a severe case of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is transfusion. That's the only way to deal with, to deal with it, is to get rid of the blood and you know, use transfusion to, come, you know, to bring in new blood with effective hemoglobin because there's no way to reverse the effect. Um, with carbon dioxide, is you know you just you know take that person out you know with an oxygen oxygen mask, your your body can get rid of carbon dioxide. That that's how it, you know, our body was designed to well not designed but that's how it does things. It can get rid of carbon dioxide, but carbon monoxide is permanent. It can it cannot get rid of it. But fortunately, computers do not emit carbon monoxide, so we are in no danger of you know, being killed by carbon monoxide using computers. 
Right. So are there any questions so far? All right. If there are no questions, we'll move on to the next topic, you know, which is the chassis, the case of a computer. How do we put everything together inside you know, the enclosure? So let's go to computer case. Computer cases. And this is where you know, people can have a lot of expression of themselves. It's like, I like this kind of case. I don't like that kind of case. You know, I like this design. Blah, blah. Um, so we look at you know, computer cases. The first thing we'll do is we'll notice you know, what kind of types, you know, um, because these are all based on the type of motherboard, okay, the form factor of a motherboard. Um, most of these are ATX you know, because that's really the most common type of uh, motherboard form factor. Then you have the micro ATX, which is the smaller one. And then you have mini ITX, which is the smallest type. Um, usually a larger case that is designed for a ATX, you know, like full tower, they will also have the ability to accommodate smaller motherboards. Okay? Uh, which one do you think is more expensive? Just in general, you know, a general ITX you know, full tower case or a mini ITX you know, desktop or slim case. Mini. Yeah, mini ITX is more expensive because people who look for those kind of cases are willing to pay more money for the smaller size. Whereas you know, with a full tower case, you know, they're just commodity items. And they're not too expensive. Um, you look at the price range, you can see that you can get a case all the way from 10 to $25 to $750. For a case? For a case, yes, for <laughs> a metallic little box, yes. Pull that one up. I want to see what. There's more to it than just. Well, box. yeah, but yeah, you know, but but even so, seven hundred fifty dollars is a lot of money to spend on the case. Yeah, but if you look at the histogram, which is basically looking at the the frequency of each price range, you can see that you know most of them are from twenty five dollars to seventy five dollars, and then you have the more expensive ones. You know, there are still a lot of those. But if you look at the extremes. Um, 11 of the super inexpensive ones and 19 of the super expensive ones. Oh, wait. One of the super expensive ones. Then <laughs> um, you have many. Sorry? Click on that one. Well, I'll click, I'll right click on it and then we'll take a look later. So I can finish this part first. Color, okay, that part is not too important. Case material is kind of important. Um, I'm kind of surprised to find, a, oh, okay, aluminum only has 51, aluminum plastic has six, and then aluminum slash steel has 29. Um, but you can see the majority is the steel and the steel slash plastic ones, because, the, the, because those are just less expensive material to begin with. Why do you think someone would go for an aluminum, alu, aluminum case? It's much lighter, and it's, it also has a better thermal property. You, you can actually have uh, heat to transfer out of the case just by you know the, the case itself when it's aluminum. All right. Well, I'm just going to take a peek at the you know really expensive one, Silverstone Tangent Series. It's an aluminum full ATX tower case. That's a pretty big case. You know, each, each, uh, each cover you see here is going to be able to accommodate a five and a quarter inch uh, drive, an optical drive. So that's a pretty big case. I'm thinking this case is going to be about this tall, you know, compared to the one that I, that is over here. Um, let's look at some of the other design elements. Now I think that's a power button, and it has a. Um, plastic cover here uh, for people who want to show off the interior of a PC. Okay, you can you can buy all kinds of fancy LED and you know lights and whatnot to light up the inside of the computer. Um, over here you can see a mesh design to basically stop dust but still provide you know enough <laughs> airflow. Question? No. Okay. And the and this part you know, is this is on the other side other side of the case too, you know, so it, it has good ventilation. It's all from the bottom. Why do you think the mesh opening is you know at the bottom of a case and not at the top of the case? For cool air to go in. For cool air to go in, exactly. So the design is basically you know to draw cool air from the surrounding, you know, at the bottom, and then the exhaust is all either up or to the back. 
Okay, so that kind of goes back to what we talked about last time of your know, controlling airflow. It's not the amount of airflow that is important. It is how the air is flowing through the case that is important. This is the other this is the other side, you know, this is the panel where you have a little plastic panel here that can, you know, you, you can use a, uh, you can show off the inside of your computer. And that swings out like this. Um, this really is a good view of the product. Okay, so let me just kind of zoom in a little bit here. It's got even more force on the Sorry? It's got even more bays at the bottom. Yep. So these are five, uh, these are three and a half inch, you know, hard drive, uh, let me turn off the light because you know it's washing out of the case. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So when you look at this case, um, the bottom part has all the drive. These are what we call the drive bays. It has six in inside um, internal hard drive bays. Each one is capable of you know accommodating a three and a half inch typical you know desktop hard drive. Um, so that's pretty good. I mean, if you use RAID 5, that means you, know, you can have, you know, a, you can have a various type of setup. You can have a three drive setup with three hot spare at the same time. You can have four drive with two hot spare and so on. So you can, it, it, this is designed to accommodate, you know, a fairly, you know, elaborate, you know, design, I mean, a uh, setup. You have two fans here. Can anyone kind of guess, you know, the direction of air, you know, is it, do you think it's, blowing air up or down? Yep, it's blowing air up so that the air will enter through the two sides at the bottom and it will blow itself up. And then this portion here is, you know, I'm not sure whether you can see it, but there are little holes or um, mounting holes, you know, on, the, <coughs> on that particular metallic plate. Can you see it? Just barely maybe? So that's, those are the places where you would uh, put in what we call a standoff, you know, which is basically a hexagon type of nut that you put, in, you screw into it. So your motherboard would stand up, it would be offset from the back of that particular plate a little bit. And then on the top here, you know, I think there's another view on the top. I believe, you know, these are all additional fans, you know, to basically push air out from the top of the case. And down here, you know, this is a kind of more, more and more designs to use a power supply down here. Um, so this base here is used for power supply. Um, but when you, when you mount a power supply down there, I think usually it has to be mounted kind of like upside down, but it really doesn't matter all that much. Yep, go ahead. I have a friend who said that they, they were building a computer and they said that the power supply is better at the bottom, not on the top. But why is that? Why is it better at the bottom? I do not understand that either. All the cases that I have worked with has the power supply on the top. Um, the power supply at the bottom, we kind of changed the orientation of the design too, because it, you know, the routing of the power cable would be different. Does anyone know why you know people or new designs put the power supply at the bottom? It's probably just something better airflow. They figure it out somehow. I do not know because you know a power supply blows air out from the back too, so it would just kind of. Yeah, I don't understand why they put a power supply at the bottom. It's not that heavy. It's not like for balancing, you know, issues either. But yeah, I've seen a lot more, more and more. And when they're doing stuff like that, hmm? like at the top. Um, because a power supply has its own exhaust fan, mm -hmm. and when it's at the top, then you are encouraging air to flow all the way through the entire case before it is, you know, pushed out of the case. Mm -hmm. But if you put it at the bottom, then you have a kind of like a, kind of like a short circuit, you know, of air. Um, I, I, I see what you're saying. Like an eddy current. Mm -hmm. like an eddy. Yeah, yeah, it's just, you know, you, you're, it, it's not flowing through the entire case. All right. The other interesting part about this case is I don't see any opening, you know, back here for the motherboard, you know, accessory to open up. Or maybe I'm not looking at the case in the right orientation. No, I'm looking at it in the right orientation. It's just a panel that pops on. So this entire panel pops off? Yeah, I think it's like just like a, a thin like panel that probably pops off. Okay. Maybe. This is one big case, I can tell you that. Because a full-size ATX motherboard would usually take up this much space. Oh, you know what? I think I, th I, think I know what it is. The, the, the panels opens up on the top. 
it opens up on the top. The, the orientation of the motherboard is such that you know, the uh, USB ports, the display ports and whatnot, they will be on the top of the case, not on the back of the case. Because the motherboard is a, rectang a rectangular kind of shape, and that's the rectangular shape that I'm looking for, is you know, the motherboard will be put here, and then the panels will, and also your PCI slots and whatnot, will be actually be opened up on the top here. I can show you a little close-up that confirms that observation. See these guys here? Those are the, the panels to let the PCI Express slots through. Um, so if you have any expansion slots, it will be going through the top instead of the back of a computer. So this computer has a very interesting design that is not normal for a regular case. Yep? I think that's the one my uses for this video rendering. Okay. So do you see any advantage of having all the slots open up on the top instead of the back of a computer? Uh, you can link them really easy because it goes straight up to your uh, monitors. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Okay. And I think the uh, top video can be actually slide it. Mm -hmm. So you close it up if you want or open it. Okay. Cool. Okay, but that, that makes a little bit of sense. <laughs> And this is the front view, you know, with all the uh, USB. These are basically designed to plug in onto the motherboard itself. Uh, see. I don't think this picture. This is the back side of the computer, and you can see the back side is completely closed off because the slots open up on the top. This is the top of the. You know, this is yeah. This is the top of the computer, and this is where you know you will have access to the slots, which is kind of strange. You know, to the uh, USB ports, you know, display port and stuff like that, they're all opening up on the top. And that's the size of the whole thing, you know, 25 inch by basically 26 inches. That's a really big case. Um, it, I know it's a big case because, you know, what is the normal height to a tabletop, like a dining table or a desk like what you have here? Hmm? Um, not quite. It's usually 27 inches. So just kind of imagine the case of the computer, is, which is 25 inches. It's just two inches below the, the, the surface of your, you know, of your table. That's how big the case is. It's, it's this tall. And it's about as long, too. <laughs> so the width is 8.85 inches, you know, which is, you know, my hand, this is, my hand stretches out, you know, to about 8 inches. So that's about you know, about an inch or more than that. So the width is not excessive, but the size of the thing, the, the height and also the depth definitely is you know, kind of big. All right, so let's close the images and now we look at the actual specification of a case like this. Um, you can see motherboard compatibility here. It is compatible with you know, ATX, micro ATX. Extra large, you know, uh, ATX. That's like a super size, you know, ATX uh, motherboard. It does not handle mini ITX. It doesn't make any sense, though. You know, if you buy a case this big, why do you want to put a mini ITX board <laughs> into it? Mini ITX is tiny. It's really, really small. Um, so it doesn't make sense in that case. Uh, external five and a quarter inch drive bays. There are nine of those. In other words, you can attach nine DVD drives to this thing and they all have front access to the DVD, to the optical drives. I cannot imagine any application you know, that will require nine optical drives or the exposure of nine uh, drive bays. Yep. Your, uh, multiple CDs at once, it, might it might be useful. Here's or if you want to do a RAID setup and you want to be able to do hot swapping, which means you, know, you, you can you know, take a drive out while the system is still up and running, and you're running a huge you know, storage you know, system, you may be able to use up some of these you know, uh, drive bays too. Uh, there are no external three and, a quarter, three and a half inch drive bay because you can always adapt a five and a quarter inch into a three and a half inch. The internal drive bay, there are six of those, we could actually count it. Uh, hot swap capable which means you don't have to power down the computer in order to replace you know, one particular drive. And I did not even see the two and a half inch drive base. Apparently it has three of those. <laughs> it's hidden somewhere in, inside the expanse of the case. 
Um, expansion slots, there are nine plus one, you know, that's a lot, okay? You know, most of the motherboards do, that we looked at only have about four or five expansion slots. This one can handle nine. So that means it has nine opening slots in the back, or the top in this case. Uh, the front ports, you know, what you can attach to the front are three USB 3, two USB 2, audio and mic. Um, okay, nothing too serious here. Um, cooling system, one 120 millimeter top exhaust fan, two 120 bottom intake fan, and two 180 millimeter, these are big, you know, these are big fans on the side. Um, and we have side air duct for you know, better direction, you know, directing air, cool air to the processor. Um, what are we looking at here? What is a, what is a DBA? The A stands for, I can't remember what A stands for, but this is a measurement of noise, okay, or sound level in general. Um, what is one decibel? Well, it is, it is decibel, okay, your decibel. Deci means it is one tenth of something, okay? And a bell is a, is a unit, but it's actually not a unit, it's more like a ratio, okay? Yep, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say decibels are logarithmic scale. It's a logarithmic scale and it's log 10. So, you know, that means, you know, something that's 20 decibel is 10 times louder than something that is 10 decibel. Um, so these fans are actually pretty quiet. I mean, a fan that is only about 18 decibel is actually considered pretty quiet. Huh? The bottom one, it can range because it depends on the RPM. When it's 700 RPM, it is 18. When it's running at 1200 RPM, it's 34. 34 decibel is still considered extremely quiet you know, for, and, uh, for a 180 millimeter fan. Um, look at this. <laughs> That's the case without anything. So imagine how heavy this thing is when you populate it with six internal three and a half inch drives, optical drives, the motherboard itself. The motherboard is not really that light. I mean, if you think about it, you know, you look at the motherboard, it's like a flat piece of thing with some component solder on it. Cannot possibly, do, cannot possibly be too heavy. Um, but once you have your CPU mounted on it, the CPU cooler mounted on that, it act it's actually a few pounds right there. So when, when, when this thing is fully populated, it's about 50 pounds. I would say it's about 50 pounds. That's pretty heavy. You go to Home Depot today, you pick up you know, a bag of uh, mulch, you know, two cubic foot of mulch, that's 50 pounds. You go to Costco, you pick up a big bag of rice, that's 50 pounds. Okay, so this thing is 50 pounds when it's, you know, when you have all the components, you know, installed, that is pretty heavy. Yep. Kind of makes that thing, like, almost theft-proof. <laughs> <laughs> That's not something you just, like, pick up and go with. No, no, this would be kind of hard to pick That's up and go. That's just the weight of the case. So. Hmm? That's just the weight of the case. You yes. Know, <laughs> the power supply and, yep. and everything else that you put in it. Exactly. That's why you would go with the mini, uh, <laughs> the other part that I'm kind of surprised is for a case this expensive with this much space in it, it can only accommodate one power supply. There are cases that can accommodate multiple power supplies, like two or more. No, uh, that's two. Right down here. Oh, dual power, power supply support, support, but I can only see one place to put a power supply. All aluminum construction with anodized sandblasted finish, so you won't leave fingerprint on it. Uh, room for fitting powerful water cooling equipment. Motherboard backplate opens opening behind CPU area for quick cooler assembly. Um, that's actually kind of important. Let me show you what it means in the pictures. It's one of those things you know if you have you know did it once you would appreciate the design. This part here. It opens up. Okay, you can see the back panel. You know, if you open up the other side of the case, this is transparent. You can actually see through it. This is where the CPU is going to be located on the motherboard, and the CPU cooler or most CPU coolers require two plates. You have one plate behind the motherboard, 
to supply the strength you know, for the CPU cooler because the CPU cooler is a really heavy thing. So you have one plate, okay, if I have to draw a picture. This is the motherboard looking from the side. This is the processor itself. And this is where the big you know, CPU cooler and its fan is located. This is heavy, okay? If you just you know, rely on the motherboard itself and put a screw through here and put another screw through here to attach the whole thing, you're putting a lot of strain on the motherboard material, which is FR4, okay? So what happens is, you know, with uh, most CPU cooler design is they, put, they give you a back plate that you put behind the motherboard and then you put the screw, you know, onto that thing. So this way it will, uh, it will spread out the stress over a much larger area on the motherboard and it will it won't cause as you know it won't easily cause any damage to the motherboard if you do it this way and that's why they have an opening like this so that you can mount the back support uh, bracket on the motherboard easily you know on the other side of the motherboard any questions is anyone going to buy something like this <laughs> <clears throat> no. If I buy one, I don't have the space to put it. Not for seven hundred dollars. Seven hundred bucks. If you, if someone give one to me, I'll just have to sell it because I can't. I don't have the space to put it. All right, but it is a good case of you know to demonstrate you know the features of a motherboard. Okay, so somewhere between you know, one hundred to two hundred bucks, two one hundred to two hundred bucks would be a good you know, case. And this one, you know, if you look at the rating, there are 6,000 ratings for this one. It has five eggs out of five. So that means you know, it cannot be a very bad design. Okay? So let's take a look at this one too. We only have about a few minutes left. Uh, this is supposed to be a mid-tower case. So we, it's a little bit smaller than the other one. Let's look at the pictures. We like pictures. All right, so this one has got two fans, you know, blowing air in from the front of the computer. So it's a slightly different design. Um, you can see it on the side here, it has, a, it has a clear panel so people can show off their motherboard and the lighting that they put inside the case. Um, on the top here, let me kind of magnify that a little bit. On the top, and kind of to the top in the front, you have the usual ports. You have the audio port, you have a reset button here, a power button, and then you have the USB, and I think this is a um, FireWire link, the FireWire. And then this portion here, okay, if you look at this opening, that's for carrying the case. It's a handle. It's a recess, you know, so you can just kind of grab onto the case, you know, like that. The back of that over here is a mesh, and inside is probably a fan, a 180-millimeter one, fan to blow air out, you know, to the top. Okay, so it's a... And then if you just look at the front, not anything too exciting here. This is the other side. Usually, it's not very you know exciting because you know it's the back side of the motherboard, so nothing really happens on that side. So it's really kind of boring on that side. Now this is going to be getting back to the um, the side where you know there's a clear panel, so you can you know, look through the whole thing. And here's a mesh, and also an opening to mount a fan. Not sure whether you can see it. It's kind of faint, you know. You can see a faint cut out of the plastic. So the plastic is only has a cut out about this big, and this is where you can mount a fan to blow air, you know, either in or out of the, the case. When you open it up and look at it, looking at it from the back side, you have one exhaust fan here, okay, either intake or exhaust. But this one is situated right next to the CPU. Okay, so that depends on how you want to arrange your airflow because this can directly draw cool air CPU. in to cool your CPU. The yep. CPU is at the bottom. The CPU is at the bottom? So this, I think that the CPU slots at the bottom. Maybe. I don't really see a slot at the top that has enough room for the CPU. The CPU should be here okay. because you know, these are the slots for the expansion yeah. slots. And then the power supply, once again, is at the bottom. But, or, sorry. <laughs> and if we look closely, we can also see um, these slots you know, for mounting hard drives. And there are a few more hard drive space down here, and then two more up here. 
these are uh, toolless you know, type of uh, hard drive mounts, which means you don't have to use a screwdriver and you know, mess with it you know, all day long. Um, it doesn't have a slide out C uh, motherboard tray. Um, these are the mounting holes. Let me just kind of magnify. This one actually has the standoffs already installed. So I want to take a closer look at this. Yep, there we go. Do you see all these little kind of copper things? Those are the standoffs. They're basically tiny little, it's a screw on one side, but there's a bolt on the other side. Okay, and you put these onto the case, and then your motherboard will screw on top of these, so your motherboard won't be contacting the case at all. And we just have, well, we are running out of time. All right. So we'll continue this later, you know, maybe on next Tuesday. I will send you um, instruction for your presentation, you know, basically, you know, how to pick a topic for your presentation, how long it's going to be, and how I'll be grading it. Um, so you will have something to work on, you know, also. I'll see you guys next Tuesday. Have a nice weekend. I was just looking for the power supply to the bottom. I guess it's for, I guess, better airflow, to get more cool air.